have about uh, three quarters, half or three quarters of the folks in church that are going to be in church. But by the time church starts, but by the time Fred gets up to speak, then, well, uh, we're going to have some problems. So if you could do me a favor and, and just sit toward the middle so that the outsides can be filled, that would be really nice of you. If you see that that can be a problem. And uh, if not, just have real short knees, okay? Hey, thank you everybody for coming on a special Sabbath. I, I came in and one of the things that people told me was, you have to reserve Bobby McGee Sabbath for Bobby McGee Sabbath. And I said, well, what is that? And they told me and they said, do you know Bobby McGee? And I said, do I know Bobby McGee? I met Bobby McGee when I was a freshman at Walla Walla College. And I can tell you that he was one of the influences on my life. He and Bob Barnes shared an apartment uh, there on College Avenue, and I would go over to that apartment and learn at their feet. Consequently, by the end of the year, I was asked by Walt Meske to leave. Uh, Jim Hamlick and I found a Buick, uh, what was that? It was a, a Belvedere, some sort of, it was this old car with fins on it. You remember that, Lane? And uh, we found it out in this field, and we got it, and, and we paid a farmer $25 for this thing, and we got it to run, and we cut the top of it off with tin snips and put a couch in where the back seat was, and we would go around and, and uh, the, all around College Place and Walla Walla, and Bob would sit in the back and play his trumpet while we went around. We had a club, we called it the Gern Blanston Club. Do you remember that? And uh, Bob, you have such a good memory for an older man. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we had such a good time and by, by the time by the end of the year I had enough and I had to leave but uh, but Bob carried on the tradition I don't know whatever happened to that car do you know whatever happened to that car yeah. it's in heaven now <laughs> yeah well being a part of what was going on in that car I guarantee you it's not in heaven Bob, welcome, and I know you got a lot of friends here this weekend, and I want to I want to welcome everybody to the Sunnyside Seventh Day Adventist Church. My name is Mark Wittes. I'm the lead pastor here, and uh, I actually uh, work for uh, uh, a person down here that uh, is one of our associates. She tells me what to do, and and Pastor Cara is awesome, and and then Pastor Juan chimes in, and then after Pastor Dave is done speaking, I'm like, okay, you know, um, I just work for them. Uh, glad that you're here and glad that you can celebrate a beautiful Sabbath with us. I want to take just a moment to invite you all to stand up, turn around, shake somebody's hand, welcome them in the name of the Lord, say happy Sabbath.
Okay, folks, let's not think we're that friendly here. This is Sabbath. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for being uh, welcoming, and uh, we love it that you're all here. God bless you as we celebrate Jesus today together. Good morning. We are so excited that you all are here. And I am excited to talk to you about what happened at Oshkosh. You know, we had such a good time and, and we did take the kids and we allowed them to have all sorts of experiences before that as well. We took them to Six Flags and Noah's Ark Water Park and we had all sorts of fun. And you know, there's something about this giant tent city that goes up every five years. You know, here in Portland, sometimes in some areas, we're familiar with tent cities, aren't we? But even the kids were amazed at the size of this thing as we pulled up. We had told them, you know, how many people were going to be there. And as, as we pulled up and they just saw the fields and fields and fields of tents, they just could not stop saying, wow. 
Wow. And then we pulled in right by that big stage there uh, where they meet and they just could not believe. They could not wait for that first meeting. And let me tell you that the meetings were great. I mean, even from the first night where they, they did a little bit of a fireworks thing from the first night, um, it was just spectacular. Unbelievable programming, unbelievable things during the day. Each night they would have a talent a portion of the program where Pathfinders could share all, all sorts of talents. And that's a group of Pathfinders there um, from Canada uh, showing their traditional Filipino dance. Um, just amazing. They had an amazing ventriloquist who was even funnier than Bobby, if you could believe it. Um, but, you know, after a while, some of the people didn't want to go on stage with him because he would kind of joke about the people that were up there. Uh, but the kids loved it, and that's Lily, his... Uh, his pet sheep, you know, David was his shepherd, so he had Lily, the sheep. And, you know, every night he'd come out and make jokes about the people that were up there with him, and the kids loved it. Uh, and then they would worship. And, you know, there's something powerful about having 55,000 people worshiping God together. Uh, and, and our kids, uh, even though some of them go to the, the, the schools around here, and, and, you know, I remember the first time when I went to public school and I went to a gathering like this, I just got goosebumps to be in such a crowd of other people my age who were worshiping God. And I know that many of the kids said it was a powerful experience. Uh, the speaker was great. There he is with his gloves. That night he came out and with gloves on fighting. Other nights he came out with different things. The plays were fantastic. Broadway quality, you know, I, I grew up in New Jersey and, and I've been to Broadway and, and they do an amazing job. You know, but ultimately, Ultimately, it's not about the show, it's not about the pin trading, it's not about the honors. It's about introducing kids to Christ. And it's about helping kids to make decisions for Christ and to serve him. And so obviously, you know, there was over, there was over a thousand pathfinders baptized at Oshkosh. And we are working with some of our own pathfinders. Uh, some who have said they wanted to be baptized and we're working with them and with their families and we're trying to get them ready and one of them uh, recently got baptized at Big Lake as well and we're gonna we're gonna take care of that and, and show that next week um, and vote autumn in um, but you know it was just amazing to see and you know they did something different this year and, and I just want to share this last story with you and then I'll stop talking because uh, there's somebody else around here that likes to talk even more than I do but um, <laughs> You know, they did a next-gen pastors thing. You know, I say, next-gen pastor, what is that? Next generation of pastors. You see, we have a, this challenge in our denomination, and that is that most of the pastors are getting near retirement age. And so they said, well, why don't we take these kids who are involved in, and come to this thing and see if we can somehow help them to make a decision, ask them the question, are, are you interested in serving God? Are you interested in working for God? And I have to say that I believe very strongly that the way that Sunnyside does Pathfinders has helped this. And I want to thank you. Because, you know, you could tell us, yes, yeah, spend all your time trying to milk us for money. Spend your time doing car washes and spend your time doing the, the, the banquets and the different things. And you could do that. But Sunnyside has said, we don't want you to do that. We want the kids to actually serve. We would rather the kids take that time and serve in the community, serve in the church, serve in different places. And so when I went around and I started asking the kids, I said, would any of you maybe be interested in going to ask questions or, or, you know, about what it might be like to be a pastor. You know, at first, they all kind of just looked around at each other and were like, and they, they want to know who's going, who's going. And then a couple of people said, yeah, you know, I, I would be interested in that. And then somebody else said, you know, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in it too. Now, I have to say that they did something sneaky, those NAD ministerial guys, because they also were going to serve them ice cream. Oh, yeah. You want to be a pastor or you just want the ice cream? I don't know, right? But I didn't tell our kids that they were having ice cream there. And I started asking them, you know, I, I think, and then, then one of the girls said, I think I want to go. And then another girl said, I, I think I want to go. Pastor Cara, you, you've been modeling well, apparently. And, and so, you know, they, they, they started, and before I knew it, 
there was a group of them that wanted to go. And, and some of the girls got in a golf cart and I said, well, you know, by the way, I'm glad you guys are coming because God loves it when you serve, but they're also going to have ice cream there. And they're like, they're going to have what? I said, shh, shh, shh. I don't want everybody else to go for the ice cream. I just want people to come if they really, you know, feel like they want to serve God. And so we wound up taking 11 of the 30 pathfinders that went with us to Oshkosh to the next gen pastor meeting. Not because of ice cream, but because this church, Sunnyside, because the Pathfinder staff has instilled in them a desire to serve others, to serve God. And you know, when we got there, they could not believe that group that rolled in. You know, other groups, other groups had one or two people, you know, mostly boys. Um, and we rolled in and we had 11 kids. Half of them were girls. And, you know, yeah. And you might recognize Tracy uh, Wood. He was here. Uh, and uh, there's Jose Cortez as well in that picture. And, you know, they were kind of like, our group was kind of like rock stars. This was the first picture. And then pastors and all sorts of people started piling in. And, and the kids were just so excited and so happy. Um, but you know what? I, I'm thankful that this church supports this program. I'm thankful that this church says, we're, we, don't, we don't need you to milk us. We want you to teach the kids to love Jesus and to serve Jesus. And to me, this is a direct reflection. This is a direct reflection of what Sunnyside's vision has been for the Pathfinders, of all the work that the Pathfinder staff has put in um, to try to instill that, that attitude of service in our children. And so I pray and I hope that we continue to support our kids that in ways that allows them to want to serve God and that allows them to want to love God. Thank you so much for all that this church does, and I pray that you would continue to support us as we continue to move forward trying to impact the lives of the young people that God has put in our midst. Thank you, Pastor. I'll try not to go on and on and on. <laughs> Mike Stevenson, can you say good morning, Mike? This is Johanna Chevrier and Kaylee Chevrier. And uh, they're going to be singing later on. I'm Bob McGee. This is my leader, Bob Barnes. And we added the, the king of trumpeting, Leif Halverson. We say hi, Leif. Let's sing together. This is the Lord's hour. This is, they call it the, the big hour, right? The 11 o'clock hour. So let's sing for all we're worth here. Bob, lead us, my friend. I love your hair. You look like Jesus, Bob. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
That's good. They sound pretty good. Yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to So we're going to follow, follow Bob. He's somehow an Adventist with great rhythm. So I've been, work, just, I've just, been working just on be my like rhythm. James White, please. James White in the house today. <laughs> Coming down the aisles, thumping his Bible. Come on now. Here we go. We go. Get away. is 
<laughs> oh, magnify the Lord, for He is worthy to be praised. Oh, magnify the Lord, for He is worthy to be praised. Oh, stand up, stand up, blessed be. This is the call and response part. Say, blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock. Say, blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock. Hosanna. Hosanna. Be magnified. Magnified. Hosanna. Hosanna. Be magnified. Be magnified. Say, blessed. Blessed. Be the rock, be the rock, say blessed, blessed, be the rock, be the rock. I just want to thank Bob for leading us through worship for people who came up not reading. I think our preacher today is going to talk about people like that and uh, churches that came up helping people to know songs without even being able to read was a wonderful tradition. So thank you for being part of that tradition. You just connected with a few hundred thousand people in the world. Stand together.
Thank you, Leif. First of all, I want to thank Bob McGee for uh, inviting me here this weekend, and it's a privilege uh, to be here at your church. And I do really want to say, first of all, that I want to thank this church group right here. Um, I was the athletic director at Walla Walla University for 30 years, and I see some of my players out there <laughs> and uh, around the auditorium. And when we were there at uh, Walla Walla, many, many times we came to this church, and you folks hosted us. We came here to church, sometimes we performed up front or spoke or did things. We had potluck here, we stayed at the nurse's dorm, some of you would come to our games. And it was a great experience, I just wanna thank you for so, those many times that this church hosted Walla Walla University in our athletic program and promoted that. And we just really wanna thank you for that, I just wanna say that. Paul Howard, one of your members, has a memorial service here this afternoon, and I wanna mention that also. If we could, shall we kneel wherever possible for prayer? Dear Lord, it is good to be here in your house with fellow Christians who love you. We cannot thank you enough for what you do for us every day. As we depend upon you and let you live in our lives, it's an adventure, and we thank you for doing that for each one of us. Bless this church, Lord, as it moves forward. It is great to hear what's happening with our young people here and pathfinders across the United States. Thank you for this weekend, for so many alumni and so many people who come to this uh, softball tournament and spend Sabbath and Saturday night and the weekend together. So many great relationships that are renewed and you are the connection. You are the connection through your Holy Spirit to all of these friendships. We thank you for each one. Bless us this day, Lord. Be with our speaker today, Fred. May you use him that we may learn something that will make us more like you today. We love you and we thank you. In thy name, amen. Something happened to me over the last year. I'm now 60 years old, which means, which means some of you that I knew you were in your 50 or 60, or I'm either catching up to you or something else is happening right now. But on behalf of my wife and two kids, Robin is here, and Lucky Day, and Casper Knight, 13 and 15, they're 6'5 and 6'2 respectively, and Marion, who is 91 and taller than all of us, we're happy to do this. It says offertory. As the hardest thing for a pastor to do for me is to call for an offering, because all I want to call for is tithe. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I love to call for tithe. It, it, I, I drive my tithe and I live in my tithe. And, but you know what the church really does need to have a church budget. You guys have a beautiful church. It's only second to the church in Adventist Worship Center in Phoenix where you're welcome to worship anytime. <laughs> Even though it's 135 degrees today there. <laughs> you have a beautiful church here, and I remember playing as a little kid, little kid with, uh, right out here before the church was made both with Bob Barnes. And, uh, and I see the angels playing the trumpet. I'm always happy and thinking of uh, the different, uh, you know, I tell you, Lloyd Summers, uh, he comes to our church once in a while. It's nice to see him at church there with me and the, the gang. And, and I know Duff Gorrell's been a member of our church, and uh, he's now pastor at the Foothill Seventh Avenue Church as of this last week. I'm happy for that. 
So as they say hello to all of you, they love uh, Sunnyside. Isn't that a nice thing that we keep loving each other? Is that great? Yeah. And so as we uh, play today and as we sing, and you come tonight to the program, it's, it's, it's an offering. Uh, as long as I can walk, if people have me, I will come and enjoy people. And I will enjoy, and, and I, even if it's just to see Bob Barnes, I'm happy. He still loves me after all the terrible things I say to him all the time. He still loves me. Anyway. So as the deacons come up, I'm going to play a song that my father played with his saxophone. And uh, he played Bless This House with his saxophone. And I thought I'd never play it, but I do as often as I can. So bless this house, bless each one of you, the lives that you live. Thanks for being in my life. And as I live, I do see the people that I make happy and the people I offend, and I'm sorry for those. But if you love people and you're able to say you're sorry and go onward, that's all you can do. And hopefully that you'll make a difference somehow. So Mr. Wynn is playing. I call him Mr. Wynn because I'm afraid to call him Hugh Wynn because he's my teacher. But he's here. How many of you had Mr. Wynn in, in your life somewhere? He, look, look at the hands there, Hugh. So thank you. And, and uh, let's play this song. And the deacons pick up the offering. Bless this house. I will wear a crown. I will wear a crown. I'm going to ask for my mother. How many of you know Marion? If you'd come up here and sit right here in this chair, and I'm going to ask for the audience to pretend that they were little kids once, just a cappella voices. And I want to tell you, there's going to be two things happening here. We're going to pick up the kids' offering. So. Do they know how to do that right here? Oh, so the little white cups, we don't, in Ohio, we're afraid when people come up to your car with a, a white cup, but, but in Arizona, they don't do that. So as my mom's up here and the little white cups are getting ready, I want you to pretend that you were back when you were that age of the kids that are coming up, okay? So ready? Just your vo voices. I will wear a crown in my
kids. I'm an old guy now, but guess what? I have someone who's older than me, but actually is very young. And I want to show you something. <coughs> this is, my name is Bob, and her name is Marion. And Marion was at one time your age. Is that true, Mom? Were you, this, were you at their age at one time? Do, can you remember that far back? Yeah, she can. Okay, but I want you to look at something that's very important, and I think even out here on this side, let me see this hand, your right hand. I want you to put your hand to the fingers down. Look at my mom's, can you see my mom's hands? See, my mom has got some arthritis, so sometimes they're a little bit, you know, like that. Look at my hands. I'm starting with arthritis too, because I played too many sports. Yeah, see, your hands are nice and just young, and look at your skin. Look at your hands. See, look at the difference between my mom's hands and my hands and your hands. Now, maybe, at, at, would you, don't do that over here sitting down. Don't look at the people's hands. These hands, right here, I'm going to hold your hand. These hands, when I grew up in Africa, these hands took water from the roof. And once a week, for a couple hours, she would take it and boil it so that all the bugs and the bad things came out so that we could drink water. Is that cool or what? These hands made cookies. These hands made bread. These hands made clothes. Where's the amens from out here? Okay. These hands spanked me. <laughs> okay. These... <laughs> But these hands changed my diapers. Amen. Amen. <laughs> these hands taught little kids at school. These hands did the board meeting votes for places that we went all over the world. These hands pay the bills. Amen. These hands drive cars. Amen. These hands grew up on a farm, milk cows, took care of chickens. These hands, is that true? Is all this true? No, no milk. No milk. She didn't milk the cow. Did you ever milk a cow? No. Okay, I lied about that. Sorry, kids. <laughs> hey, I'm the only leader I know that's told a lie. Okay. So, 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 she has three brothers right here. She has three brothers. No, I didn't know. Yeah. These hands have loved. What about your hands? Have your hands loved before? Have your hands gone up to your mom and your daddy or the people that your brother, sister, and, and I know that we sometimes, yes, did your hands, your hands, yes, your hands. So I'm going to tell you one thing. God told us we can be the hands, the feet, and other things for people if they can't do it. Does that make sense, kids? We can be the hands for other people. Amen? Amen. And when you think back, I would like for you to take a look at those you love and look at their hands. Maybe you could hold their hand. Wouldn't that be nice? Would that be, you know, you hold that, like they're holding hands right there. That's such a nice thing right there. So, and, and I'm going to tell you one thing. It's not wrong, wrong to hold your friend's hands. Did you know that? So when you go back, maybe you, you go back to whoever you're sitting with and you grab them by the hand and say, thank you for using your hands. And we can remember that Jesus taught us how to do that because he used his hands. They actually did something for us. They saved our lives. Jesus' hands saved our lives, just like your parents' hands, and just like you will save people's lives. Is that cool, kids? Yeah. All right, I thank you so much. Can, can you say thank you, Mrs. McGee? Can you say that? Thank you. Will you remember her hands? Okay. She's, look at that. She's still, she, she still cooks like mad. You gotta, I go over to her house and say, make something for me, and she does. So it's nice. Okay. <laughs> so, so. My wife even asked her to help, and she does. So it's nice. Thank you. I will wear a crown. Thank you, kids. Go touch somebody's hands. Thank you, Mom. But you can hold my mom's hand too. It's all right. She's awesome. Remember their names? This is Kaylee and this is Johanna. And their brother is Jeffrey and dad is Russell. And mom is Teresa. And she plays the organ for the Central Filipino Church in Los Angeles. And if you've ever been to a Filipino potluck, amen. amen. So these girls can sing. You'll, you'll be crying when it's all over. 
And, uh, and they're going to sing tonight as well. That's a, that's a little teaser for you. To that She, the, these girls, she just got out of law school, and she, just graduated, and she just graduated from Walla Walla with teaching. So, and she, and, uh, so they're very, very highly smart and nice, and my kids really like them. Lucky Casper, do you love these girls? They're there. They love them so much. And they're free babysitters. That's what we like. We like about it, too. So stand next to them, Mike. Thank you. Hello and happy Sabbath to everybody. My, again, my name is Johanna and this is my sister Kaylee. It is so nice to be back in the Pacific Northwest and it's definitely cleaner air here than in Los Angeles. <laughs> Today we are going to be singing I Am Not Ashamed of the Gospel. Thank you for having us this morning. It's not always easy Bearing Calvary's cross We've been ridiculed by those who don't know Him And mocked by those who don't believe Still I love standing
That was beautiful. Thank you. It is a great Sabbath to be at Sunnyside. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Matthew 25, verses 34 to 36, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. And I just encourage you to keep these words in mind as you hear the powerful sermon Pastor Fred will bring to us this morning. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. When I was in school, this girl always was kind to me and nice, and I didn't know what I was doing there. I know a little bit more now, but I want to tell you, to, to hear you read the scriptures and to be a friend of yours, I count it a great privilege. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Too. I love, Lorraine's awesome. Thank you so much. Fred? Thank you. When I was in college, uh, we liked to play football, and uh, I always liked to play football until I met this guy because he could outrun me over there. But, but I'm waiting for the day when he's going to get hurt and then I can, then I can hear. No, but I want to tell you, he, he offered me an opportunity that saved my life. And uh, when I was pastoring, somehow I, I, we were moving somewhere to Ohio and I thought, Ohio, why would I ever want to go to Ohio? Twelve years before, he invited me to Ohio to speak at a in summertime. And when I went to Ohio, the two pastors were given the job of calling to see whether I was okay were friends of his. <laughs> so I was okay. So you know, I'm just telling you, that meant a lot to me. And they said, oh, we love this guy. He's great. Thank you, Fred, for that opportunity. So I'm grateful that you have opportunity to come and do this for us, even though I never thought I'd be in Ohio, but I loved Ohio. So God bless you, brother. Hey, love you, man. Good morning. Um, Pastor Mark, thank you for sharing your pulpit. And uh, we know how important and sacred this time is. And Bobby, thanks for carving out some time for me. Um, you, you're very intentional about a lot of what you do, and I know there's intention behind uh, days like this. And I want to thank you for being part of it. My wife Jill and I, um, we traveled over last night from Boise, and it's good to be here. I, I'm curious. I, I don't feel like I know you all very well. There's probably 15 or 20 of you that I know. In fact, I can see an old seminarian classmate of mine, Dan. Hi, Dan. He's the captain of the Oregon Conference ship here, and it's going in a good, good way. I um, 
How many of you don't normally come here? I'm just curious. You're, you're visiting today. So maybe about 25, 25% or so. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I need your prayers because I vacillate between wanting to encourage you and being mad, and I don't know what I'm mad at. My wife asks me sometimes what I'm angry about. It's, it's a... Um, a struggle. I pastored for 10 years and then I started my own company and over the years that company has grown. We have about 200 staff. We're based in Boise, but we own properties, real estate, uh, apartment communities around the United States and it's been, uh, it's been a wonderful ride, but the older I've gotten, the more I wanted to turn back towards ministry. And so I get, I'm getting to speak a lot more than I used to. In fact, some of you don't know this, but I was out of the church for probably 10 years. I didn't even read my Bible. Um, found out I was an alcoholic. Um, was growing my business. I had a pierced ear. I've got tattoos, which I could show you. No, I won't. I won't do that. <laughs> but next time, tonight, tonight, that's, that's, that's a teaser. I might have just killed the attendants tonight. I don't know. <laughs> Front, row. Front row, sure. Mirrors and everything, but... This, it's a privilege to be here with you, and I, I really, I want to share with you something I struggle with as a fifth generation Seventh-day Adventist, because there's just some things, I think we get off course sometimes, and, but I, uh, by the way, do any of you remember Terry Tamiosi? She's our office manager now, oh, there's a wave of a hand back there, she's our office manager now in Boise at Cloverdale Church, and she went here, I think it was 12 years or something like that, but anyway, she wanted to say hi. Um, Christmas, 1967. There was a humble Christmas tree at Estacada, not very far from here, about 24, 25 miles, and underneath that Christmas tree, for those four boys, was a, a pair or a matching set of boxing gloves. And these were the big, these were not the small eight ounce kind where you can really hurt somebody. These were like twice that size. It was like duct taping pillows to your, to your hands. But the two oldest boys of those four boys put them on and they got into a brawl as much as a second and first grader can. And they're wailing away on each other and there was a twist, there was a turn, there was a poke, there was a swing. And one of them ended up with a hernia. So loaded on Christmas Eve in the back of the family station wagon, the kid with the hernia with a pillow now behind his head as he laid flat in the back of the, the, this family station wagon that was probably from the 1950s. They drove down the road as quick as they could to the nearest hospital, which happened to be just right over here. That was my first trip to Portland Adventist Medical Center. And I've been coming back ever since. Um, this, it's remarkable to be back here, really. I'm 59 years old now. And I want to share with you, because my time is short, um, you know, this, I want to share with you what's really on my heart. There has been so much of Seventh-day Adventism that in our hearts, I think our intentions were well placed, they were well meant, but we've created what I call a G-rated world. We've created a place where we can separate our kids from other kids. We can send our kids to just our schools. Of course, we welcome other kids if they behave, but we want to create a safe environment to pass on our values to our kids. Uh, sometimes we have, in clear at the other end of the spectrum, we even have senior retirement communities where you can go and you don't even have to talk to somebody who's got bacon bits in their house. I'm talking about the real ones, not the fake ones. But when you start to look at the world that we've created, our intentions were good. We wanted to remain unspotted from the world, like it says in James 1.27. But in some way, in separating ourselves, we lost our mission in some ways. Now, some of you are saying, well, it's the three angels' messages. I want to change and refocus you for just a little bit today. And I, there are so many good things that this church is doing in this community. It's really remarkable when you start to go down the list. Uh, my wife's two children, um, Andrew and Holly, are both nursing graduates of Walla Walla University and 
and attended. Uh, one, our son lived over here for a while. But they all lived within just five or ten minutes of, of, this, of this church campus. And we've gotten to know this community in, in, a, in one way, but in other ways not. And it's really intriguing to me to see how the Spirit's moving in this church to do some incredible things in getting involved in this community. But it's remarkable, isn't it? Within just five or ten minutes of where we are right now, you can be in a very dangerous part of town. You can drive by people who are just waking up right now because they spent the night in a tent in a park or on some just little narrow piece of grass that's alongside a busy road. There's people, we saw one last night, an individual that you could just tell in his face that he has had so much pain in his life that he has to self-medicate. And yet, in the G-rated world, when you drive by somebody like that, you're thinking, well, I'm not giving them any money. He's just going to go buy alcohol. He's just going to go buy drugs with it. But the idea is self-medicating for somebody who's been through so much pain. That's sometimes all they've got. You know why? Because we're stuck in our G-rated world, and we haven't gone into the world they live, the X-rated world, to reach them. It's easy to say that everybody needs the gospel, but people don't need that. They need the gospel with skin on it. They need you and me to take more risks. We've got to take more risks to go where they are. We need to find them. We need to do everything we can to reach out to them. I want to share with you uh, the story of Pastor Bill Wilson. You may or may not have heard of him. He is the pastor of a Sunday church. Whoops. He jokingly says that uh, his mom abandoned him as a child because he was so ugly. He's a caustic character. If you've ever seen him, maybe some of you uh, have heard about him. But he's one of these guys who's just not easy to get. He's kind of like trying to snuggle up to a porcupine. He just is a, a, an unattractive individual in so many ways. But this guy is the senior pastor of the largest church in North America. Now, when I tell you that over 135,000 people worship at his church every weekend, isn't it tempting to say, well, he must have really lowered the standards to get that many people to come. This guy is a pastor of a church that's in the inner city of New York. And this is what I want you to know about him. He has 135,000 people attend his church every weekend. He himself, when he started this church, he went to a, a street corner, and he picked a street corner, and he got to know everybody in that four-block area. He spent most of his time during the day just standing on that corner, getting to know who would walk to work, who was walking home, who the kids were, who the grandparents were, when school was in, when school was out, and he made it his job to know everything he could about them. And so as they, has, as they have added pastors, he keeps adding four block sections to this church that he's grown. Every pastor on their staff has a four block area, and it's really remarkable. This is not an easy church to pastor, though. This church has got mostly street people or what we would call very low-income people. He got in a fight with a church member, and Pastor Mark, how would you like a church board meeting that went bad where one of your board members took you up off the top of the medical center and threw you down? Well, that happened to Bill Wilson. He was actually thrown from the top of a building. He's been shot in the head by a pimp because he was trying to save one of the women that the guy was controlling. But he's laying his life on the line every single day. He remembers just before he passed out three or four blows to his head because he was attacked by a guy that had a brick in his hand. And the guy just kept hitting him in the head. And after skull surgery, he was able to recover from that. But that's what he's had to go through. He has actually seen 22 people killed in his presence. 22 and that would never happen here, would it? Now pray for me because I'm starting to get mad. Honey, pray for me. We have created safe places. Again, our motives, our intentions were right. 
but the kind of things that happen just five and ten minutes from here, walking distance, people's lives are being traumatized to the point where they shut down and they won't ever feel again. But we're safe. He's had staff who have been murdered. He talked about one of his staff, female staff that had been raped and they called for the police. And after a half an hour, police hadn't arrived yet. He had to carry her down the stairs of a multi-story building. <clears throat> He's been stabbed twice. And yet, he still, every week that he's in town around his church headquarters, he still drives the bus that goes out, picks up all the kids and all the families and drives them to his church. He still does that, even though about half the time he's going around the world speaking now. He's written a couple of best-selling books. You, if you Google him or look on YouTube, you can actually see some of the interviews with him. But he's a remarkable guy. He's gone into the X-rated world. Joe Aldrich who used to be the president of what was then Multnomah College, it's Multnomah University now, he wrote a book 30 years ago called Gentle Persuasion. And in that book, Joe Aldrich was referring to churches that create, he called it the crusader castle approach. You get all the Christians in this castle, and then maybe two or three times a week you ride out, you kill and beat up a bunch of Muslims, take stuff from them, and then you run right back to the castle. So many of our church programs are thinking like that. We, we've got to get back to the castle. We've got to get back to safety. We don't stay there and dwell. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's part of the story of the Good Samaritan. The kingdom of heaven is at hand didn't mean that it was coming soon. It meant that it was there now. The people of this world need brave people courageous people who in some cases have no money to offer. All they have is their time that will go and actually do something for these other people. It's remarkable what Bill Wilson has done. I stumbled across this George Bernard Shaw quote and I wanted to read it to you. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the community and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. Amen? For the harder I work, the more I live. Life is no brief candle to me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I have got hold of for a moment. And I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it off to the future generations. Folks, this church community belongs to the community, right? And all of our visitors, your home churches, belong to the community where you find yourself. We can't just covet it. It's probably one of our biggest sins as a church family is coveting the G-rated world environment when the very people that we could be helping and making a difference are just minutes away. And we walk by them every day. We drive by them every day. Be the gospel with skin on it. Desire of Ages, page 497 and 504. Unless there is practical self-sacrifice for the good of others in the family circle, in the neighborhood, in the church, and wherever we may be, then whatever our profession, we are not Christians. You know, the guys that passed the, the person that had been beat up in the story of the Good Samaritan, all of those guys had all the right dogma. They were theologians, they had studied it, they had dedicated their lives to it, and yet they walked by this practical self-sacrifice that Ellen White talks about. It gets me. I, I stand before you as a hypocrite because I know that there's different things I could do. There's more I could do. Even though my schedule is full, I know there's more I could do. So what we've been wanting to do and what my wife and I have been intentionally doing is building our lives around ministries that we see that there's a need for. And again, this church is a juggernaut in doing community outreach. I mean, 
I think my eyes started to gloss over after I heard the 15th or 16th thing that this community is doing, or this church community is doing in this neighborhood here. It's remarkable what's going on. But this, in my heart, I just, I'm not sure we're getting to everybody. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if we have half of one foot in the G world and the other half in the X, and we're constantly going like this. I'm not dancing. This is just an illustration. Could I have some music? It would probably help pass it a little better. <clears throat> we, um, I've done probably five or 6,000 apartment units now in my life, and I've done okay at that, but I tried to make money building single-family homes, and after five or 600 of them, I quit doing it because I, I could never make any money at it. And one of the last homes that I built, it was a parade house, and this parade house was, it was about two days before the parade of homes was to begin, and the realtor called me up and she said, you gotta come down here, I think we've got a problem. And so we, our office was about a mile and a half away, so I drove down there, and there is a cover over the crawl space access in the walk-in closet of the master bedroom. And I could see that it was just tilted, it was just a little off, and I went and I looked and I lifted up that, that hatch and down in the crawl space was a sleeping bag and a duffel bag. And so we decided to figure out who it was that was, it looked like somebody was squatting in this parade home. So we set up at night and we waited and we saw somebody park about two blocks away and we saw this dark figure walking down the sidewalk, go down the side of our house, lift a screen off. There was a window that was open. He slipped through the window. And that's when we went in there and we met him. And I won't say his name. But we found out that he went to the same high school that my kids do, or did. He had aged out of the foster care system. He was 18 years old, but he was only halfway through his junior year of high school because he'd had so much trauma and being moved around to so many families, he hadn't been able to keep up academically. That high school of 1,500 students, I found that the guidance counselors at the school estimated there were somewhere around 40 homeless kids just in that high school alone. So we wanted to do something, but we didn't know how to help them. And sure enough, a 24-year-old came to us and she's a remarkable young lady, and she, it's called Gem Friends, G-E-M Friends, and that's, of course, Idaho is the Gem State, and she named it after that, but to this date, she's, I think it's 27 or 28 individuals now. She goes out and finds homes that she can rent, and she collects monthly commitments to where somebody's paying the rent for these houses, and these kids that have aged out of the foster care system can stay in these homes for free as long as they're working and going to school and getting some kind of trade or getting some kind of college degree. That's a 24-year-old did that, and that's a remarkable thing. But in the Treasure Valley alone, there's about 750,000 people now in the Boise Metroplex, and they're estimating there could be as many as 1,200 homeless high school students that have aged out of the foster care program alone. So we're not even hardly touching, the, scratching the surface of this problem. But it's an example of what can happen. And folks, there are homeless people everywhere and you don't always know their story. Sometimes it's substance abuse. Some of us, our weaknesses are apparent by the way we look. Some of us, our weaknesses we're able to hide. Some addictions are more prevalent than others. Some are more crippling than others. But ladies and gentlemen, even just a couple of hours a week invested in the right person can be a remarkable thing and a blessing that can just bring the gospel present instantly just by simply being there, by stepping out of the G-rated world into that X-rated world. Um, I saw a movie can't remember if it's called Innocence or Priceless. I think it's Priceless. The lead singer of a group called For King and Country starred in it. But it was one of these movies that I had, um, it was on a topic of human trafficking. 
And I had happened to find an FBI study that showed where the calls were coming from for reported trafficking of, of, of people. Portland, Seattle, Spokane, Boise, Sun Valley, Coeur d'Alene, these all had different colors of intensity based on the number of calls that would go into the hotline for the FBI. And when I saw how many there were in Boise, I had uh, one of my computer hackers go in there, something called the dark web, and they actually went online and found three pages, like going on Craigslist, they found three pages of listings of uh, young Asian girls or uh, come to this truck stop, uh, you, you can choose from any variety, and this is all found on the dark web. And we, were, we went after them, that was one of our first things, and we actually got that where we hammered them so hard, and we got FBI and TSA involved, and they actually took that down in Boise. The, but that's just one thing. I mean, it is surrounding us. The, you talk to an Uber driver that drives at night on weekends, they can tell you about the number of instances where they think they've been trafficking somebody and didn't even realize it. You talk to night clerks at hotels, and you'll find that they know and see situations where they should be reporting, but a lot of times they're afraid to, or they don't know who to talk to, they don't know who to call. Uh, ERs, during one survey that, uh, where they surveyed girls that were stuck in trafficking, they found that there were 10 or 15 contact points that they have with the outside world, because they're trapped in an X-rated world. There's nobody there to get them out. And it's not so easy for them to get out as you would think. They're stuck in there and they don't know how to get out, but if they get hurt and they go to ER, a lot of states will release these girls to a gentleman who claims to be their father without even documentation. I know major hospitals, I'm talking hospitals with 1,000 beds, three times the size here, that were allowing and releasing these girls. The average girl trafficking starts at age 14. They are so traumatized within just a year or two that they don't even know how to leave. They've forgotten everything has been so hard for them that their previous life is almost forgotten. When they try to go to leave, the manipulation that happens with them emotionally is staggering. These girls, sometimes their sister is with them in the same house. They call them hives, at least that's what I've heard them called. They'll have eight to ten girls, and these pimps will keep an eye on them, make sure that they sleep during the day because they work all night. Well, they get emotionally trauma-bonded to the other girls. And so what happens is these pimps say, Julie, if you leave us, we're going to hurt Karen. If you don't come back, we're going to hurt Karen. And these pimps can tell. They know they're psychological experts. These guys have studied how the mind works. And so they set these traps for these girls. They're always constantly trying to intimidate them to keep them bonded to them. The average girl, according to the FBI, will have to leave seven times before she actually stays away. Seven times, and sometimes that can take two years. Do something about that in your own community. If there's an organization that's already doing that here, join them, volunteer, help out. 12 minutes away is the campus of Portland State University. There's 27,000 students. And if I could apply a national average that uh, there was, I think it was 200 uh, colleges and universities were just surveyed. There's actually been three studies done in the last two years. But they're finding that about 30 to 35 percent of college students are only getting 10 to 15 meals a week. These are students that are trying to get degrees or trying to get professions that they can go out and actually be contributing to society. They also found in this same study that somewhere between 9 and 11 percent of these college students are homeless. And that's another remarkable statistic to me because Again, they're trying to do their best. And that doesn't mean to put down the homeless that aren't in school, because again, so much has happened to them that they don't even have the capability of having academia stick in their brain because they're just simply trying to survive for the next hour. We've started doing medical and dental clinics around the United States. Um, 
We actually had 1,500 volunteers in Baton Rouge recently. Baton Rouge, it's called East Baton Rouge um, Parish. It's a little over a million people, about 1.1 million. There's less than 1,000 Seventh-day Adventists in that parish. About 600 of them are active. So think about that. Over a million people in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 600 Adventists, and we had 1,500 volunteers. We only had about 100 volunteers of our 1,500 base that were actually SDA, so less than 10%. But if you were to walk into that clinic when all these people were being helped, you would sense God's spirit there. It was a remarkable thing because everybody, Ellen White calls it in Christ's Object Lessons, page 385, she calls it wherever you see the impulse of love, you'll see the working of the Holy Spirit. She goes out on a limb. If I could find a limb, I'd go out on it with her. She says, these people never even heard the name of Jesus, never even heard the name of the commandments. If they continue to follow those promptings, that'll lead them into the kingdom. Amen. I see the Holy Spirit everywhere. I see him down by Voodoo Donuts. I see him at Goldie's in downtown Boise. I see him everywhere, and it's remarkable to see what's going on. The Holy Spirit doesn't know a G-rated world and an X-rated world. It lives in the world. It is everywhere at all times, and it's available to us as encouragement, a compulsion, and a compulsion to love and to go and do good things in his name. Amen. I am pro-life, but I'm pro-choice. For others think about that and I know a lot of teenage girls that the guy is never around but the girl gets pregnant and what happens while people are out protesting and working on thought-provoking Facebook posts there are other people that are actually going out and finding houses where they'll find a grandma figure or a mother figure and they'll say, okay, you get the master bedroom, but this four-bedroom house, we're going to find three pregnant girls, and as long as they agree to follow these rules, these girls that have been kicked out of their homes in some instances by Christian families, they've kicked them out. They don't have anywhere to go. And yet, there are places, there's 27 homes in Seattle through a Presbyterian church program there where almost 100 girls are being served through this very program. This is another thing that, depending on what it is, and by the way, I had a nice conversation. I won't say any names, but I had a conversation with somebody in between services about, you know, well, I, I really feel um, a conviction, a passion to work with animals. And that's a wonderful thing because animals are part of God's creation. So dogs and cats, um, that is a worthy place. You guys all, this is nothing new. You've all heard this before. You've probably heard some of these ideas before. But where is your passion? Are you doing something because you think it needs to be done? Or is this really something that you're passionate about? Because if it's something you're really passionate about, that's when the life changing starts to take place. Some of you might have this passion to help these pregnant girls. Now here is something anybody can do. I met a guy down in Zion National Park. And he told me, it was we were talking, it was around a, a campfire. There were probably 100, 150 of us. But he was telling me about how about 20 times a year he'll go and he will get a booth at like a county fair or he'll go to flea markets and instead of selling stuff, he just has a table. And on the table it says free advice. That's all there is. That's all. He's got two chairs on the other side of the table. He sits down. He never hardly gets up. He's old. He's probably 80, 85, but he's got a little jar on the table that says donations. It doesn't say tips, but it says donations. And most of the time, he gets enough donations from people just walking by to actually pay for the space of what he put in to be there. But he just listens to people. In fact, he said, I should call it free listening because that's what he does most of the time is he just listens. People need you. The world is in desperate need of you and your presence. And 
it, it takes courage sometimes. Um, we've stepped towards that X-rated world and we've put our toe in, we've gone back, we've showered, and this is okay, oh, whew, you know, and then you just explore, you step out a little bit more. I, I know this, is, this statistically this would be terrible if I could only convince one of you to do this, but that's all I'm after. I have low standards, just like Bobby McGee has low standards for friends. So, my goal is just to change the way one of you looks at all of this. Take a chance and move from this G-rated world that is so safe and cozy and comfy and move into that X-rated world and find out where you're needed. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. He shows that it consists not in systems, creeds, or rites, but in the performance of loving deeds, in bringing the greatest good to others in genuine goodness. My favorite phrase is disinterested benevolence. Now I've had guys argue, I've watched them argue. You've heard the old adage, the Jewish proverb, wherever you have three rabbis, you'll have four opinions. It's also true of Seventh-day Adventists, isn't it? You get us together, we've got opinions, we've, we've thought through all kinds of stuff. I, there's nothing wrong with that, but folks, if it doesn't lead to action, it's an old-fashioned waste of time. To move towards this G-rated, away from the G-rated world to the X-rated world is an incredible thing to happen. And, but in the story of the Good Samaritan, how many times was that man who was beat up, laying in the ditch, passed by? How many times did people walk past him? Back in the 60s, a 12-year-old boy looked up into his mom's face. They were on a street corner. And this is what he remembers her saying. I can't take this anymore. Stay right here, I'll be right back. So he stood there on that corner and the night came, he was getting nervous, uh, no, he was looking for mom down the streets, he was looking in the face of every person that passed him, no mom. He spent the whole night on that street corner, no mom. He was there the entire second day not one sighting of his mom. A second night spent on that street. People kept walking by. Two full days into this, people are still walking by a 12-year-old boy who's not gonna leave that corner because his mom said she'd be right back. It would be three days before somebody actually stopped. A mechanic who happened to be a Christian, he had problems of his own. You got problems in your life? My word, if we were to hear the stories of what some of you guys are going through right now, we would all be in tears. Just in what the group of people we have here right now. But at the same time, the potential for love and for being involved in people's lives among this group, the financial resources, but, and you know what, I've been fortunate that way with financial resources, but you know what I found out? <laughs> All across the economic spectrum, all of us have just the same amount of time, and that's probably a more valuable commodity than anything on this planet. So if all we've got is time, that's another thing we can give. But this man, with his life in, in losing a son to leukemia, stopped and talked to this 12-year-old boy and took him home. They put him into a closet that they converted into a small bedroom in the church where he would be raised the rest of his life. He would go to summer camp. He would clean the church in exchange for being able to stay in this church. And uh, he would eventually grow up and he would actually become Bill Wilson, the guy that I told you about that is the pastor of the single largest church in the United States. He started his church in New York on a street corner because he knows that not it's too many people walk by. There's too many people that are busy or they're caught up in something in their head and they walk by the very people that they could help. When ordinary people like you and me, when we leave our G-rated world 
And we go where people are who need genuine help in goodness, in love. We can do extraordinary things together. Leave, or we're, we're ordinary. We're, aren't we ordinary in God's eyes? But he just loves us incredibly and he gifts us in all kinds of ways. Maybe even ways that are dormant in your life right now that you don't even know about or haven't even thought about. God can move you and we can do extraordinary things together as we serve others in his name. That's what a sheep does. I want to get your goat. Some of you got that. I want to get your goat. Sometimes we're more goat than sheep. I want us to be sheep. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give food. go to prison. I hate going to prison. I just got licensed in the last year to go into our local prison, 1,050 inmates. I'm the only Seventh-day Adventist, I just found, I'm the only Seventh-day Adventist man that's registered to go into the prison, 1,050. And we've got six or 7,000 Adventists in the Treasure Valley. I'm not saying that to, look, God drug me there. I fought just like Jonah. Um, and I'm a hypocrite because there's stuff that I know I could do and I don't. So let's leave that G-rated world with courage and go and serve in his name. Thank you. this. 
Thank you for the potluck that's coming on. We have great food at this church. Oh man, it's really good. Thank you for Pastor Mark and the pastors that are here that allow people to embolden their way with some of the things that Dr. Fred said to us today about these things that we talked about. Lord, I'm looking forward to being with you, but in the meantime, I'll be with you with the friends that you gave me. So heaven starts on earth to those who love us now. I want to thank uh, you so much for the family that we have at Sunnyside. And I hope that tonight when we get together, we're going to see a lot of people, some people who don't necessarily go to church that often, but they will come here and they'll see, hey, this is a great place to worship people right here. So as we eat together, as we talk together, and as we love together, may we be the hands that you would have us to be. And thank you so much for love. What a great thing and privilege that we can experience it. Amen. You may be seated and listen to this right during the potluck a little bit. My friend Malcolm Clark, who used to be a member here, we're going to come in here and play a little music. So you might want to come in here some of that in about an hour. Okay, God bless you. Mr. Wynn, play your, play your song.